Hi everybody, my name is Rick and I was part of the CIS version 8 editorial panel and worked on previous control panels for years. This is the uh, 17th in my video series doing a deep dive into the updates into each of the new controls. I have links to videos from my controls 1 through 16 in the description as well as a link to the CIS critical security controls page to download your own copy to follow along at home. Today we're talking about control number 17, incident response management. In version 7, incident response was control 19, and it remains a second to the last control in version 8. Now, while it's near the end of the list of priority, it is our safety net for when controls don't work, weren't implemented completely, or not at all. We can't expect all technical and procedural controls to be perfect. Our infrastructure and our threats to it change over time, sometimes continuously. So there is a need for a capability to respond or remediate quickly when an incident is identified to continue operations. I have a couple friends who are West Point graduates. I asked one of them about 10 years ago what the Army taught in a War 101 class. He said that if you have something to protect, you put up a barrier, but then you monitor that barrier with firepower because at some point it will be breached. It could be hours, days, weeks, months, or even years, but it will be breached and you must respond quickly to protect the asset. Well, it's the same in the digital world. We rely too much on our technical protections to work as advertised, giving us a false sense of security. When I was a virtual CISO, I constantly found two things lacking among the security programs I came in to work on. One, a lack of governance, which you know links the business to IT, and that's a whole other video. And two, a lack of an incident response capability. They all had lots of tools to tell them what was wrong or when things go bad, but rarely did they have a plan for what to do when that happened. So that's what this control is about. So let's look at the safeguards control 17. I'll post control number 17 here and version seven control number 19 over here on the left. Remember, we renamed the sub controls to safeguards. We reordered the safeguards to align with the implementation groups. <clears throat> 17.1, designate personnel to manage incident handling. This is a reword of 19.2, assign job title and duties for incident response. Before we had had two ask, assign duties and assign titles, so we simplified it. 17.2, establish and maintain contact information for reporting security incident. This comes from 19.5, maintain contact information for reporting security incidents. This is who are you gonna call? Uh, it could be internal, could be third party vendor, law enforcement, cybersecurity insurance company, or maybe all of them, um, but have their numbers written down, not stored on some file on a system that could be encrypted or ransomware, write it down. 17.3, uh, establish and maintain an enterprise process for reporting incidents. This comes from 19.3, 19.4, devise organizational wide standards for reporting incidents, and 19.6, publish information regarding reporting computer anomalies and incidents. This isn't redundant from 17.2, where there we say, like, have contacts for who to call when something goes wrong. This is establishing the process of how to do that. You would expect that incidents are discovered by security operations, but often uh, it's the end users, or even third parties that alert an organization to major incidents. There needs to be a process to help them do that. You'll note that these are all implementation group one safeguards. Everyone needs a, a response plan. You know, who's point person, who are they going to call, and what's the process for notification? 17.4, establish and maintain an incident response process. This comes from 19.1, document incident response procedures. You notice this is a fourth <laughs> uh, and an implementation group two safeguard. If you're a small company, just know who you were gonna call. <clears throat> you know, but if you're an implementation group two or three organization, have a plan for your response procedures and you need to have those documented. 17.5, uh, assign key roles and responsibilities. This combines 19.2, assign job titles and duties with 19.3, des designate management personnel to support an insolent handling. 17.6, define mechanisms for communicating during incident response. This is a new safeguard. When incident response team is responding to an incident, there should be another team communicating or developing communication strategies for internal and external stakeholders. I'll talk more of the, about the importance of that later. 17.7, conduct routine incident response exercise. This is from 19.7, conduct periodic incident scenario sessions for personnel. These exercises are so important to practice and run through communications and decision points internally with the stakeholders before you have to do it for real. 17.8, conduct post-incident reviews. This is a new safeguard which basically says, you know, learn from your incidents and improve your response and recovery next time. 17.9, establish and maintain security incident thresholds. This is the only implementation group's three safeguard and somewhat comes from 19.8, create incident scoring and prioritization schema. 
This relates to incident declaration and classifying different types of incidents for reporting and metrics collection. So now I know the changes, let's do a deeper dive into highlight some of these nine safeguards. I will put those down and I'll put up over on this side the details. 17.1, designate personnel to manage incident handling. If nothing else, have a point person and their backup <laughs> to manage an incident handling process. This is not an activity where you want multiple cooks and everyone should be clear who to call. If your incident response process is handled by a third party, then that point person should know who they were going to call. Even if you have a company with just two people, one of you should be assigned to be that coordinator. 17.2, establish and maintain contact information reporting security incident. So speaking of who to call, this is that contact list and it should be current. It'll include that internal person that you defined and any internal or external third party technical support, uh, internal or external communication support, internal or external legal, law enforcement, regulatory bodies, if applicable, cyber insurance provider, and key customers if you have notification requirements in your contracts and your maybe your industry ISAC or other information sharing peers. We suggest having multiple versions of this list on different locations on and off the network and including printing it out and verifying these contexts are complete and accurate yearly. 17.3, establish and maintain an enterprise process for reporting incident. So now we know who's in charge and who we're going to call. Let's make sure everyone knows how and when to report an incident. This process will include the reporting time frame, who to report to, how to report, whether you call them, email them, there's a portal, there's a Teams channel that's up, and the minimum information to report. This will feed the incident response process that's in 17.4, establish and maintain an incident response process. This process will include the roles and responsibilities, um, compliance requirements you know, for notification, a communications plan, and how to categorize incidents. While a comprehensive program for what the event is versus different incident types is described later in 17.9, the basic details of intake and security incident classification as it's an incident should be you know, kind of fundamental. For instance, a server not responding is an event, uh, discovering that server is locked up with ransomware, that's an incident. 17.5, assign roles and responsibilities. Within incident response plan, it's important to outline key roles for groups and organization outside that incident response team. And it may include the IT department, security operations, compliance, legal, HR, facilities, physical security, communications, public relations, and of course, executive leadership team. During an incident, every one of these teams will need to be informed. And many will have business decisions to make depending on the path or outcome of the incident. IT will likely need to remediate or rebuild systems. Compliance might need to notify stakeholders. HR might need to inform employees. Communications might need to post press releases. And these will all be directed by the business leadership. 17.6, define mechanisms for communicating during incident response. This includes internally and externally and have backup methods in case the primary method is not available. There are a number of threads to this. So first is communication for managing the incident. You know, then there's notifying the internal stakeholders, notifying the employees and close third parties, notifying the customers, and there might be notices for regulators or the general public. Internally, the incident response team won't ever want to use email, but instead some out of band method like a Teams channel, Slack channel, Zoom chat, you know, in, or even like Signal app on your mobile phones in case the incident is taken down the network or the directory service and you don't have access to those. Always consider your network untrusted during a major incident. And you don't want your adversary watching your communications and responding accordingly. Otherwise, internally, you usually would just use email to the staff, again, unless you feel your network is untrusted. And you might have an employee portal or some emergency alerting system like Everbridge to send, you know, phone or text messages to staff staff. For external, this might be social media posts, emails, phone calls, or even hard snail mail letters. Uh, for some federal or state customers, regulated organizations might have a notification portal that you go in and submit incidents to. This process should be reviewed annually. 17.7, conduct routine incident response exercise. Whether you're on a sports team, putting on a musical, or in the military, practice and training for the real event is critical to success. And the same as incident response. So there are lots of scenarios you can run through with your team from a small malware infection to sensitive or regulated data that's stolen or even ransomware locking up the entire network. The purpose is to have people respond in a way that they would to practice you know, who they're gonna call, what they're gonna do, what decisions need to be be made, what are the dependencies of those decisions, and who needs to be notified. 
this should happen at a couple of levels. First, at the technical team, um, but but also with the executive leadership. You know, as I've said many times, technical people don't make business decisions. Choosing to take down a business application to restore it or even pay a ransom is a business decision. The leadership needs the information to help make that decision. Doing tabletop exercises help them ask questions and prepare for, you know, if or when that decision comes and what dependencies need to be in place. There are also decisions on when to call cyber insurance company, when to call law enforcement, outside legal counsel, or the regulators. Again, these are all business decisions. On the technical side, you might learn new things about how to access devices on other networks or the best way to isolate corrupted systems or who actually knows where to gather the logs. You know, then when there's an incident, you know to check with Janet because she can get the VPN logs, but Nathan knows where the email logs are stored. All of this is to practice gathering information to answer questions to help the business make decisions. 17.8, conduct post-incident reviews. This is the lessons learned. Doing a hot wash after to examine what went well, what didn't, what information you needed but didn't have, what you know should you have communicated sooner, etc. You know all of this should be documented and used to update the process. You can also use this to track your improvement over time. 17.9, establish and maintain security incident thresholds. This is where you define what is an event, what is an incident, and what are your different classifications for these incidents, which might involve different teams, communications, or decisions. We list some examples like you know, an abnormal activity, a security vulnerability, security weaknesses, data breach, privacy incidents, things like that. There are plenty of resources from SANS or NIST on setting up incident response categories, and some people use the Verizon Verus framework categorization, which is what they use in the Verizon Data Breach Report. These categories might change after you have a couple incidents, and after some lessons learned, you realize you don't have a category that fits you. But, but also, having categories help you with tracking metrics for how many types of incidents you get and in within this time frame, and, and it might influence new protections and detections. Now let's look at the upfront material, or the narrative as we call it. I'll put that down and I'll, I'll put that up over on this side. Uh, so control 17, uh, the overview we consolidated from version seven uh, the, the, to be a little more succinct. <laughs> um, so the overview here is, you know, establish a program to develop and maintain an incident response capability. And we list the elements to prepare, detect and quickly respond to an attack. Very straightforward. In version seven, it was this, okay. Protect the organization's information as well as reputation by developing and implementing an incident response infrastructure and the list of elements for quickly discovering an attack and then effectively containing the damage, eradicating the attacker's presence and restoring the integrity of network and systems. Whew, <clears throat> that was a mouthful. It was almost like a legal document, but I actually believe that I'm the one who wrote that <laughs> six years ago for version six. So that's on me. We cleaned it up a little bit. On why this control is critical, we talk about how comprehensive security programs include protections, detections, response, and recovery capabilities, and that often the final two are neglected. <laughs> so gone are the days where when a computer is discovered to have malware, you just re-image a machine and call it a day. Um, it's important that you understand what happened, how it happened, and figure out how to prevent it from happening again. Also, you need to understand the full scope of the incident. While one machine is discovered, uh, there might be others that have the malware, but it just haven't executed yet. So the goal of the instant response is to respond to threats before they can spread and impact the organization. We reiterate that we can't expect protections to be 100% effective, so you must have a plan for when the protections fail. And remember that you know, barrier story from the War 101 class, um, you know, to know how to respond, to identify, contain, and remediate the incident to fully recover. Doing improper or incomplete incident response can extend the incident from days to weeks to months or even longer. Uh, we discuss the importance of communicating with stakeholders, especially the leadership team, who must know what the potential impact the incident could have on the organization to prioritize their decision. They might know of regulatory disclosures, SLAs, or business impacts that the technical people aren't aware of. We touch on the concept of dwell time. Uh, that is how long the attacker is on the network before being discovered. Often we read about in the news, companies having attackers on the network for weeks, months, or years before discovering that they've been compromised. The attacker doesn't always want to make their presence known and the longer they're around, the more persistent they can be and, and add more back doors to make them get back in if you think you eradicated them. The dwell time is critical for ransomware as well, as this is a money-making scheme and the attackers are very organized and efficient to know what to do once they get a foothold. They need to find that critical data, start exfiltrating it while looking for it to compromise the backups to increase their chance of getting paid. This could all be done in a matter of minutes or hours, so dwell time is important these days. 
we'll switch pages to procedures and tools. We start by saying that even if an organization doesn't have resources to do their own answer response, it's still critical to have a plan, you know, safeguards one through three, right? Um, and, and know who to call. But ideally, know the sources of protections and detections available for whomever will run the incident so they can gather that information to help make decisions. And of course, the communications plan, which I've talked about plenty, we suggest a third party help and scenario based training or the tabletop exercise I talk about to identify gaps in the process. And we talk about how mature organizations will include threat intelligence and or threat hunting into their incident response process. And this could help the team be more proactive or at least focus on the response procedures best on known tactics and threat actors. And finally, we include a link to the Council on Registered Security Testers, CREST, their Cybersecurity Incident Response Guide. And there's plenty of other resources if you just um, search for them. So that wraps up Control 17. Hopefully it was helpful for you to go through the change between version 7 and version 8 and a little discussion on, on what they all mean. If you haven't already, please download the controls yourself from cissecurity.org. And if you have any comments or questions, you can go to our workbench on cissecurity.org and you can help contribute to the next version. And as always, if you have any questions for me, feel free to put comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a great day. Hey everybody, as you know, I have no pets to share, but I have some interesting pieces. As it's Christmas Eve when I'm posting this video, I have some whimsical felt Christmas figures.